So really the problem now is, is that uh, demand is very, very strong. Incomes are high, people have money on their, uh, in, the, in the bank accounts. Uh, demand for goods is extremely high and it hasn't, uh, hasn't come down. We're seeing the service sector reopening and so you're seeing prices are moving back up off their lows there. Um, but in terms of, of overcorrecting, I mean, I, I think there, there is a possibility on the other side of this that, that uh, inflation could, be, could actually be quite low going forward. But that's not, that's not really where our focus is right now. We're, our focus right now is um, we need to, our, our expectation is that these, uh, these high inflation readings that we're seeing now will start to abate. And that's, that's what we think. And it'll be like the lumber experience and like we expect the used car experience to be. With things like airplane tickets and, and uh, uh, hotels, which are the other two factors in, in the most recent CPI report that, that went up a lot. We expect that those prices will get back up to where they were, but there's no reason to think that they're gonna keep going up a lot. Uh, because if they are, people will build no, new hotels. There's no reason for supply and demand to be out of whack in the hotel business over any period of time. So we think that'll happen. Um, I think in terms of the timing uh, and, and the effects on inflation in the near term, there's a lot of uncertainty. The overall story is one that, that we think is right and we think the incoming data uh, support it. And uh, uh, you know, so do many, many forecasters. And, uh, and if you look at the forecasts on, um, on the uh, FOMC, you will, you will see that as well. But we don't, we don't in any way um, dismiss the chance that it can work out that, that this goes on longer than expected. And the risk would be that over time, it does begin to affect inflation expectations. And if we see inflation expectations and inflation or, or inflation moving up in a way that is really uh, materially above what we what we would see as consistent with our goals uh, and persistently so we wouldn't hesitate to use our tools to address that that's it, it, price stability is half of our mandate and, and and we would certainly do that we do not expect that though that is not our base case and and, and, and in that we're joined by many other forecasters but there's a lot to be humble about among forecasters forecasters have a lot to be humble about it's a, it's a highly uncertain business and we're, um, we're very much attuned to the risks and, and watching the data carefully. In the meantime, I would say, you know, we should, as I mentioned earlier, there's so much uncertainty around this. Uh, it's, it's just a unique situation that we need to see how things evolve in coming months and, and uh, see how that story holds up and act accordingly. Yes, we are expecting our June read on Consumer Price Index, and as Becky pointed out, Things like commodities have really reversed, and the numbers are in, and they're much hotter. Up nine-tenths, up nine-tenths of one percent for headlines. Strip out the all-important food and energy, still up nine-tenths. And if we look at year-over-year -year CPI, which has the base effect, we know it's going to be a bit higher because of depressed COVID levels a year ago, zooming up to 5.4 percent, and if we look at X food and energy year over year up 4.5%. All these numbers are hotter than expectations. All these numbers are hotter than what's in the rear view mirror. Edward cut it, isn't it wild? Sit right down there. All right, today is Tuesday, July 13th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. What else? We got the inflation data. And it didn't only come out well done. It came out on fire because inflation, and this is, by the way, the CPI, a.k.a. the CP lie, because it's always cooked. It is always muffed, regardless of the number. But even with that, the number was growing not year over year. The bullshit argument of transitory and base effects. CPI inflation is growing month over month. And now inflation is becoming a big problem. Everybody's thinking about it. Everybody's talking about it. 
everybody's making business decisions based upon it. Of course, the Fed says inflation is transitory. Trust us. And if it's not transitory, we got the tools, bro. Meaning we can nuke the whole economy and the markets. This is what they mean by tools, by the way. The Volcker tool. But the Fed says, don't worry, it's transitory. Everything is going to pass. And when we ask the Fed, what do you mean by transitory? What is transitory? A month, two months, a quarter, a year, a hundred years. What is transitory? Because the tornado is transitory. But look at what it done to my house. I got no house now. The Big Bang is transitory. Giving birth is transitory. Life is transitory. Farting is transitory. That doesn't mean that the damage will not be outlasting. Furthermore, the Fed says, oh, we're not going to use any formula. But trust us, we got it under control. We got inflation under control. Well, buddy, you don't even have a formula to guide you in what is too much inflation and too little inflation. You say, I'm going to average inflation at 2%. But what is too much that will merit tapering and changing the monetary policy? The Fed says we're not using any formula. We're just going to eyeball inflation to 2%. And now it's starting to look like the Fed is losing control of inflation. Inflation is growing beyond the control of the Fed. And this is exactly what we pointed out in this channel from the very beginning. What most economists don't understand regarding inflation is the fact that a huge component of inflation is psychological and once the psychology takes over and inflation is born and the genie is out of the bottle inflation has to work its course throughout the economy before receding it's exactly like a tornado every inflation is transitory but it will come with a lot of damages in the beginning before the tornado happens you get a nice breeze lots of rain it's beautiful. These are the early stages of inflation. But then the tornado will hit ground and you're going to start to see the damage. You have to go through the whole cycle. You cannot just cherry pick, oh, I'm going to get the nice breeze, but we're going to pass on the tornado. It doesn't work that way. And this is exactly what the Fed and inflation deniers will have to face. We also got some earnings from PepsiCo, for example. And even PepsiCo is pointing out that prices will rise higher on consumers because their input costs are all also rising higher. Inflation is not going anywhere, folks. It's going to get worse from here. They talk about used trucks and used cars as transitory. And even I believe that. But when? Because even to my surprise, by the way, used cars and trucks prices rose month over month. This is absolute insanity and it's getting out of control. Furthermore, we got earnings from uh, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. All of these came out decent. Of course, if you're wondering about your uh, Hoddle and Diamond Hands money, look no further than the results from Goldman Sachs. Five billion dollars in profit, not revenue, profit in a single quarter. Thank you to the morons who got involved in the IPO, meme stocks, and options trading mania. All of that money, all of that Diamond Hands money is going back to the pockets of Goldman Sachs. Anyhow, we will talk about all of these issues, CPI inflation, corporate earnings during the headlines of the day video. I want to focus this video on the action we saw in the stock market. Remember, before the week even started, we talked about the shift from technicals to fundamentals. In this case, the fundamentals of inflation. And I think you guys saw that in real time happening as the market was trading today. For example, the moment we got CPI inflation and it came out too hot, yields popped higher. And of course, magically, every time yields pop higher, we get somebody pushing yields down right away. These are the so-called technicals. Of course, we had some other explanations that, oh, when inflation comes out too hot, the expectations are for tapering. Tapering is not good for the economy and therefore yields go down. Baloney. The weird action in the bond market was due to the technicals. Stop reading too much into it. Yes, there is a taper tantrum moment where yields go down, but understand this, tapering pushes yields higher because the Fed bought 50% of the entire supply of bonds last year. When this sugar daddy stops buying bonds, yields will be allowed to pop higher once again. Back to the action we saw today. Yields popping higher, somebody pushed them down right away. And the algos, the technicals take over. Yields down, let's buy an insane amount of call options on Apple and Amazon 
and push these two stocks higher and the inflationary stocks of materials, industrials, financials go down. This is exactly what we saw as the technicals were still guiding the market. But midday, you saw the shift from technicals to fundamentals. Yields actually reversed higher once again, as if yields were saying, fuck you, Papa Jerome, you're not going to suppress rates forever. And we saw names like Apple, for example, which was blasting higher in the morning, impulsively so, doing a 180 back down to almost the flat line. Furthermore, the technicals were suggesting that the US dollar is topping. But we mentioned last night that the shift from technicals to fundamentals, if inflation comes out too hot, will allow the US dollar to pop higher. And this is exactly what we got. In essence, the market is saying tapering will happen sooner than anybody expects. Regardless of the bullshit, tapering will happen. And when we go back a few months ago, when I discussed with you what will happen when the market shifts from inflation to tapering, and now we're starting to play the same playbook as I expected, where you have the US dollar popping higher, yields also popping higher, and then we have mixed action in commodities and the inflationary trade. The best actually becomes behind us regarding the inflationary trade. And we also see weakness in the technology growth momentum trade as yields go higher. This is how the market should react when we have tapering fears. And it looks, at least from today's activities, that the market is indeed following the tapering playbook as it should. No funny business in the bond market as it happened before so we have to be cautious here because we're going to get more inflation data perhaps even more important than the cpi in my opinion the ppi is more important than the cpi the cpi has a lot of quote-unquote transitory elements in it the producer price index on the other hand will dictate how much producers are paying more in raw materials and input costs and how much will be shifted down to us the end customers meaning higher prices. We're seeing it everywhere. Higher prices are happening in every single purchase we make. But the Fed and their apologists say, hey, where is inflation? Is it here? Is it over there? And even if it is over there, we got the tools for that. It's transitory. Close your eyes, open it again. Boom, inflation is gone. Okay. Anyhow, folks, like I said, we have another video coming out, the headlines of the day, where I'm going to discuss all of these issues in details. For now, we're going to stick to the market's information because we have lots of developments specifically in the charts. And with that, let's start by covering how the market closed today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red, down 107.39 points or a decline of 0.31%. The Nasdaq down 55.59 points or a decline of 0.38%. The S&P 500 down 15.42 points or a decline of 0.35%. What about the sector's performance today? Shameful across the board. We have technology closing in the green, barely, so we're not going to give any medals at all. Technology closing at number one, communication services at number two, consumer defensives at number three. Of course, technology closing in the green due to the performance of Apple, at least earlier in the day. And then we have consumer defensives also outperforming due to PepsiCo, riding higher on the heels of earnings. What about the laggards of the day, led by real estate, industrials, and cyclicals? Now, the reaction in real estate is really interesting, and it is another piece of evidence suggesting that the Fed is getting closer to tapering. This is at least what the market is trying to say to us. The US dollar is popping higher, real estate going down. Why? It's going down because the market is expecting tapering. And tapering, the first stage of tapering, will hit MBS purchases mortgage-backed securities hitting the real estate sector of the market. What about the market breadth? Absolutely horrible. The NYSE, 18% advancing versus 80, once again, 80% declining. The NASDAQ, 22% advancing versus 76% declining. Do we need any more warning signals to understand that the party is about to come to an end, at least for this run higher? The market's fundamentals are looking extremely shaky, just like that building in Florida. It's going to collapse at some point. The warning signs are here. Are we listening to them or not? Moving on to futures, what's going on here? They talk about transitory, transitory, transitory. Yet energy prices continue to rise higher. We have crude oil futures rising higher today. Whether it is the WTI or Brent, all climbing higher by more than 1.5% apiece. 
also noticed the rally with no stop in sight at all for gasoline futures, gaining more than 1.7% today alone. Don't be surprised if you see 5 bucks a gallon for gas here in California. Gasoline prices will continue to rise higher. And now when we look at the estimates that crude oil prices will reach 100 bucks a barrel by September, we laughed at these projections before. But now they're looking more likely because there is no stop in sign. Inflation is out of the bottle. It's going to work its course throughout the economy. Yes, one component lumber is down, but the inflation shifts from one side of the economy to another, shifting from the housing mania to the rental market, shifting from construction materials to energy, for example. Inflation has to work its way throughout the economy. What about softs? We talked about lumber down big today, once again. And we also saw declines for both coca and coffee futures. Meanwhile, modest gains for OJ, sugar, and cotton futures. What about metals? The dollar is popping higher due to tapering fears or tapering anticipation. They're no longer fears, they're becoming reality. We have to accept the reality that the Fed will start tapering. And now we're seeing declines for the most part in metals futures, led by platinum, palladium, silver, and copper futures all down for the day. Gold futures holding steady at the flat line with very minimal gains. What about meats? Lean hogs futures, aka the new big tech, riding higher once again. We talked about the bottom in lean hogs futures. Likewise, we saw gains for live and feeder cattle futures. What about grains? We have gains led by oats, soybean oil, canola, soybeans, corn, rough rice, all closing in the green today. Meanwhile, soybean meal closing at the flat line, while wheat futures suffering modest declines today. Shifting to the big casino, what's going on today in the options market? Leading the pack at number one per usual, and of course the algos in the morning got a little overexcited when they saw yields diving down after we got one of the hottest inflation readings in a very long time. And that was followed, by the way, with a 180, both in the bond market and Apple stock. Regardless, Apple managed to lead the market in the options volume by about 2.4 million contracts traded today. About 75% of those were calls. AMC, the apes are getting slaughtered. You know why? Because other apes are selling behind your back. They're not stupid. There's no such thing as diamond hands and hodl, hoodle. Everybody's looking for themselves. And once they realize that the stock is not hot anymore, it's over, it's melting down, they're going to cash out and leave you holding the bag. Oh, but Trey says, Trey says that the mother of all short squeezes are about to happen. Trey says, yeah, who the hell is Trey? Who cares? Did the guy even finish college to begin with? You're listening to somebody who's giving you financial advice while they're still wearing their diapers. Anyhow, AMC at number two with about 700,000 contracts, about 51.5% of those were calls. Tesla, the souffle at number three. Yesterday we saw a pop, aka a pump. Today we're seeing the dump. The souffle with about 670,000 contracts, about 47% of those were calls. So again, we're seeing more puts being bought against the souffle. Some interesting names here, Nokia being squeezed higher via buying call options. Of course, there's a big difference between AMC and Nokia. AMC is over-owned, over-traded. Nokia, not so much. And then we have the pain from Virgin Galactic continues that space dump from uh, Sir Richard Branson is still landing. I also noticed uh, AbV, which is quite unusual, AbV with about 95% of the options traded today for the name were calls. And usually we don't see this name in this list at all. So something is going on here regarding AbV and I own the stock. So all I did is sell some upside calls because I noticed that the prices got elevated, the premiums for call options. So I took some advantage here and sold some some upside calls. There's no harm in doing that because even if the stock pops higher, the worst case scenario is some of these calls will be exercised and I will have to sell some of my shares at a profit. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? Starting with the ticker ARKK for, you guessed it, Tesla Witch Kathy Wood. And it is actually quite annoying when I see YouTube videos, all of these YouTubers. Kathy Wood said this. 
Kathy Wood predicted this and that. Who cares? Who cares? In two years tops, Kathy Wood will be irrelevant and the ARK Invest funds will get nuked entirely. Of course, the investors, quote-unquote investors in this garbage, will lose their money. But Mama Kathy will get to keep a few million dollars here and there. Oh, but it's different this time around. Mama Kathy is the real deal. Really? You guys forgot? Back in the dot-com bubble, we had all of these geniuses popping all of a sudden. The technology funds, the dot-com funds, from Munder Munder to Van Wagner to Ryan Jacob. Remember that? Jacob Internet Fund. All of these geniuses beating Warren Buffett, beating the market. The New Deal. It's different this time around. It's the dot-com era. Yada, yada, yada. And we all know what happened once the music stopped in the dot-com bubble. Anyhow, they're making massive bets here against the RKK by buying the 114 puts expiration date July 30th. With expectations that the name will drop by over 7% by then, they paid about a buck and 70 cents a piece to enter the trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $2 million. And here is more for the RKK. This time around it is a put spread. They are buying the 115 puts expiration date August 27th. And they paid about 4 bucks a piece for this leg, costing them about $2.7 million. But they also sold the 95 puts same expiration date August 27th. And they collected a premium of about 80 cents a piece. All in all, $550 thousand dollars so approximately the total entry cost for this trade is about two million dollars they are expecting the rkk to drop all the way to about 22 percent but not more than 22 percent by august 27th what about the trade for the ticker spy the s p 500 they're buying the 405 puts expiration date august 27th with the expectations that the name will drop by over seven percent by then and they paid about two bucks and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about 1.6 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker snow snowflake it has been riding higher due to massive call options buying. Who's doing the buying? Who knows? But they got a lot of cash. We know that for sure. In this case, they're buying the 290 calls expiration date July 23rd. With the expectations that Snowflake will rise by over 9% by then, they paid about 2 bucks and 25 cents apiece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1 million. What about the put spread for the Qs, the NASDAQ? They bought the 310 puts and they sold the 290 puts for the same expiration date of August 27th. They paid a buck and 30 cents a piece for the 310 leg that they bought and that cost them about half a million dollars in total. But they also collected about 70 cents a piece for the 290 leg that they sold and all in all the premium collected was $250,000 which makes the total entry cost for this trade to about a quarter of a million dollars. And they are expecting the queues to drop by about 20% but not more than that by the expiration date. Lastly, what about the trade for the ticker FB Facebook? They're making a bullish bet here. Interestingly so, Facebook has been trading along with the value inflationary stocks, rising higher when value leads the market, but dropping down or at least underperforming when value lags behind. So this is an interesting dynamic. When you see Apple and Amazon outperforming, you see Google and Facebook underperforming and vice versa. Very interesting dynamic. In this case, they're buying the 405 calls expiration date September 17th with the expectations that Facebook will rise by over 15% and they paid about three bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1 million. What about the heat map analysis? Here's what's going on. The inflationary trade is not at performing at all, even though we have hot inflation data. The reason is yields went down initially in the morning, but then they started to recover, closing at the highs of the day. We saw a slim, slight reversal in financials, industrials, and materials. Names like Freeport McMoran, JP Morgan, even Goldman Sachs, staging a slight reversal closing above the lows as yields started to reverse higher so the question is if yields continue to climb higher from this point on will the inflationary trade recover or is the market looking forward for tapering and tapering pretty much 
brings the party to an end. And therefore, we're not going to see inflationary stocks rising higher once again. We have to wait and see here. Is the market about to push yields higher, saying that inflation will rise even higher than it is right now, and we have still more room to grow in the economy and in these inflationary stocks? Or is inflation becoming too big of a problem at this point, where it is stagnating the economy and leading us to tapering sooner than expected? By the way, we got earnings from a classic inf inflationary name in the morning today fast nil they sell nuts and bolts ppe equipments etc it is a classic infrastructure bit but in the earnings report and we will review all of that during the headlines of the day video but fast nil management said that input costs are rising significantly higher to the point where the extra cost is hurting their bottom line. And the remedy for that is they're going to pass the extra cost to the end customer. But my observation here is, is inflation rising too high to the point where it's actually hurting companies' earnings, even inflationary stocks? That could be the case, but we have to wait and watch. What about the disinflationary side of the market, technology? We saw the big cap technology names, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, all riding higher in the morning as we saw the algos pushing yields down and popping technology higher. But as the fundamentals started to take over, those gains got trimmed. Matter of fact, Amazon closing in the red, losing all the gains from the morning. Apple closing slightly higher. Meanwhile, Microsoft managed to keep the majority of the gains. But you look at the rest of technology, semiconductors, software, not outperforming at all. Matter of fact, we're seeing severe losses in some of these names. Also notable, the performance of the souffle down about 2.5% on the heels of excellent performance yesterday. This is due to a pump and dump. There was a lot of funny activities happening in the souffle. So we're just going to leave it alone for now. Also interesting, looking at the heat map, is the bounce in Chinese names. We're seeing lots of short covering in these names, whether it is Alibaba, Pindudu, JD, all of these names got whacked severely. At some point, the shorts have to cover. And by the way, even Alibaba paired some of the gains in the morning because as yields started to do the 180 higher, we saw the Chinese ETFs also reversing to the downside. So watch out here and be careful from buying the dip in these names. Wait for confirmations before you do so. What about consumer defensives? Looking at PepsiCo, PepsiCo closing in the green with about over 2% gains. Coca-Cola also rising on the heels of PepsiCo's earnings. Again, the economy is recovering. We're seeing more attendance in stadiums, etc. And that is helping PepsiCo and Coca-Cola's earnings. This is the assumption. But the management also warned from inflation. They're facing higher costs and they will pass those extra costs down to us, the end customer. Lastly, what about materials? We're seeing the copper, steel, aluminum, agriculture trade underperforming. But what's overperforming is gold gold miners in specific. Watch out here because if yields continue to climb higher, say tomorrow, and we see the dollar also breaking above 93, my bet is gold will also reverse 180 and start trading in the red. What about charts? Starting with the SPY, 30 minutes chart. Following the bear trap, the SPY continued to rise higher, and we said we don't have a reversal signal. In a market like this, you gotta wait for a reversal signal. We don't have any reversal signal yet. We saw some weakness today, but be careful of assuming that this is a reversal signal in the SPY. Because if the market decides, hey, yields are gonna blast higher again, and we should move back to the inflationary trade, specifically financials, remember, the earnings we got today from JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs were actually excellent. So if the market decides to go back to financials, the SPY, will go higher once again. We're not going to assume a reversal until the support level of 434 is broken. Then we can talk about a reversal. But even then, we have a gap and another support level to watch for, 430 and a half. If that is broken, then 100% we have a reversal. We have a confirmation that we should short the SPY. And by the way, at that point, it's going to be a big problem because the SPY goes down if this bipolar market ends. And we see tech, inflationary, disinflationary, all going down. This will only happen if we see major tapering fears. What about the daily chart of the continuous contract on the SPY? Again, do we have any reversal signal? Not at all. 
The momentum indicators remain strong. The candlestick pattern, no reversal here, just a down day, which is a rare occurrence, by the way. And then we have the support lines still intact. If we want to look for one warning signal is the start of a negative divergence in the RSI indicator. Now remember this, when it comes to momentum indicators, the RSI is a leading indicator. The MACD is a lagging indicator. We use the MACD as a confirmation of the action we see in the RSI. And if the RSI is showing a negative divergence, it's a warning signal, but too early to make any conclusions. You want to see a reversal from a candlestick pattern, and then you want to see a confirmation from the MACD, and then you have the permission to start shorting the market. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. Look at this. We had a soft bear flag formation. We talked about this one not looking as strong or as beautiful as the previous bear flag. What do you know? The algos in the morning react to the action in the bond market, popping the Qs higher. But once the fundamentals took over, we saw the 180 and the Qs finished below 363, which remains resistance. Is this a reversal signal? It is, but you don't have a confirmation until 360 and a half is broken once again. Then not only we have a confirmation, but we have a double confirmation of the weakness in the queues. My expectations are we're not going to see a massive sell-off heading into earnings. We might see some profit taking and de-risking, but not a sell-off. A sell-off will happen if tech earnings come out disappointing. So adjust your expectations accordingly. Here is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the NASDAQ. We have this doji pin look from a candlestick pattern perspective. All of what this says is indecision, and it is usually, not always, but usually followed by a massive move one way or the other. But it is a point, an indicator, that the market is thinking about the previous move. What is the previous move? Higher, it's pretty much impulsively higher, with no stop at all. So the market is stopping right now and thinking, looking back at this massive autopilot move higher and is evaluating. Is it merited after the inflation data we got today? Will it be merited when we get big tech earnings? We're thinking about it. We're not making decisions right now. We have a slight baby negative divergence in the RSI and a slight baby curling downward in the MACD indicator. So we're watching these extremely closely. Once again, what do you do with this information? If you are long the NASDAQ, it is time to take profits. This is a seller's market, not a buyer's market. But as far as shorting the queues or bidding against the NASDAQ, you could do that but just understand the risk versus reward. Some of us are conservative traders. We wait for confirmation before we initiate a trade. Some of us are looking to be ahead of the trade, initiating and trying to time the reversal. If you hit it, it's a sweet feeling, but if you don't, you risk the possibility of diminishing your gains even if the move happens a few days later. What about the IWM, small caps? Oh boy, look at this one. 30 minutes chart. We talked about the resistance around 226, 227. But again, when you look at reopening stocks performance or meme stocks performance today, specifically AMC getting nuked, absolutely hammered today, this will have an impact on the IWM going all the way down, gapping down in the morning, by the way, which is absolutely stunning. And it was a warning signal in the morning. IWM going down all the way to 223, seeking support. And that level failed by the end of the day. We saw somewhat of a bear flag formation and it cracked below that number by the end of the day. Now, what happens next? We look at the gap. That will be destination number one. If that fails, then we have destination number two, 218. That one should hold at least for a day or two, the 218 support. The likelihood is we're going to see a massive flush down in AMC tomorrow because after hours, the name is down again and that will impact the IWM down. So the 218 destination is not quite unlikely. And here it is, perhaps the most important chart of the day, the Dixie. Now the Dixie popped higher in the morning immediately after we got the CPI inflation data due to tapering fears. And then it started to cool off going down once again as yields also went down along with the inflationary trade and we saw technology rising higher at least apple and amazon but midday when we saw the 180 reversal in yields going higher apple and amazon going down the us dollar also did a 180 building on the initial move in the morning and closing at the highs of the day and this is a great illustration between the technicals and the fundamentals the technicals were leading that the us dollar is about to top 
if it hasn't topped already and we are headed to break the support of 92 for some reason perhaps a good reason the US dollar held the support of 92 and now after the CPI report looking at the fundamentals traders are saying wait a minute here the CPI is too hot the PPI will likely come out too hot tomorrow and the expectations are tapering will happen not next year but perhaps as soon as the third quarter of this year and if that is the case the value of the US dollar should rise higher because we have less cocaine in the system what about the 10-year yield here it is four hours chart we saw the back and forth in the morning popping higher Papa Jerome pushing down yield saying forget about you we're going higher you're gonna taper bitch so we're going higher yields go higher to where the resistance zone so we should expect some resistance here but mind you this cpi number is beyond my even my expectations and i'm a so-called inflationista and the number came beyond my expectations if the ppi number and then we have the pmis from chicago empire and philly all come out hot regarding prices paid then yields could blast beyond the resistance level easily all the way to recapture one and a half percent TLT weekly chart, the weakness continues. And now we're seeing the RSI from weekly chart perspective. Remember, this is the leading indicator curling downward, weakening. The MACD should follow. And if this is the case, the gap should be closed. Do you see the gap? That should be closed. But as far as the final destination for the TLT, that remains up for grabs. If we see a recovery in yields, the likelihood is we will see the TLT going down all the way to break the support of 134 and a half. But we are way ahead of time here. It is too premature to make any conclusions. We need to monitor and see how yields and the US dollar will react throughout the week as we get more inflation data what about the vix four hours chart are we about to start another pop higher this is at least what the macd indicator is suggesting we don't have a crossing yet but we're getting very close and mind you the vix did not close the gap and it is already doing 180 higher that is a sign for strength in the volatility index can we do anything with this information can we trade one way or the other not really all we know we have a warning signal in the spy from a daily chart perspective the negative divergence in the rsi we have another warning signal from the VIX. But these warning signals haven't been realized yet. And we know that the shorts, the bears, and the likes are already traumatized. Every time they short the market, they get a pie in the face, a smack on the mouth, and the market reverses higher once again. So there is this hesitation, even though when we get the fundamentals supporting a correction in the market, bears are too scared to short this market what about apple what's going on here we had somewhat of a bear flag formation not a strong one because the consolidation happened underneath 145 which was the all-time highs perhaps that should have played to the downside but regardless the algos took over in the morning popping apple in reaction to what happened in the bond market but as the bond market started to correct higher apple also did a 180 and now forming another bear flag formation a small one perhaps a start of a new bearish formation but what we know for now is 145 acted as support at least once today so that remains the tug of war between topping formations in apple and between the support levels and the activities we're seeing in the options market at some point all of these people pumping apple via options call options in specific will start to collect gains because who wants to head into earnings holding these calls or even holding the stock at all time highs it's a risky proposition and we will see some profit taking not a crash not a correction just profit taking ahead of apple's earnings if there is a crash in the name it will happen after earnings specifically if we get any sign that the rise in earnings and revenues for apple in specific the last few quarters was due to the cocaine to the stimulus from the government handing everybody thousands of dollars what do you think we did with the thousands of dollars we bought ipads imacs uh, new iphones with new colors with tim apple's sticker on them and that helped apple rise higher but what if that impact from stimulus is fading away what if the chinese customer is also moving away from apple and reverting back to savings not spending because the chinese customer is not stupid they look at what's going on with covid they look at what's going on with the government the chinese government cracking down against technology companies chinese technology companies the likes of didi alibaba and perhaps the chinese customer is saying i'd like to save some cash rather than spending that will not be good for apple anyways we can talk about 
that and a lot more when we do the earnings preview for big cap technology names. What about Tesla, the souffle? We talked about 679 as a sticky resistance. So regardless of the funny pop we saw yesterday, 679 once again acting as resistance. It's a tough level to break above. You need somewhat of a gamma squeeze to push this thing higher, above 679. What are we seeing in the options market regarding the souffle? Traders are buying more puts, not calls. So forget about a gamma squeeze being the catalyst for the souffle to rise higher. Then what else? Are people going to start buying Tesla shares now at what? 660 bucks a pop when we have more competition, when we have more uncertainty regarding inflation and rising input costs, when we have Reverend Elon, who knows what the hell is going on with this guy, testifying in court, sending memes, talking about space. I doubt that we have a lot of support to push Tesla higher here. The momentum indicators are yo-yoing back and forth between positive and negative. We don't have a final decision yet. Look at the RSI and the MACD. I believe that by the end of the week, we will have a final decision the momentum indicators on where tesla is going next what about btc here's another one not doing good at all melting slowly but surely because the momentum is not here the pumpers already pumped and dumped and now we have the hodlers and i commend them by the way because they're using their diamond hands refusing to sell not cracking under pressure but is this good enough to push btc higher not at all. You need new buyers. These are pyramid schemes. All of these tulips and meme stocks are pyramid schemes. They rise so long as there is another guy buying right behind you. But when the buying stops, the music stops. Therefore, you're seeing all of these scams all over the place. Crypto is the future. Buy crypto. Buy BTC. You're going to regret in a few years not buying tulips. Really? No thanks. So unless we have new blood joining the, the, the movement, the tulip movement, the likelihood is 30,000 will be violated. Once that is violated, forget about hoodling. Forget about diamond hands. The margin calls will do the job flushing BTC all the way down to a minimum of 20,000. And when we enlarge the MACD indicator, you could start to see the weakness and the imminent crossing indicating that the momentum is turning negative. And this is not good news for the laser beams. So look for another whale. Who is the next whale who's about to buy BTC and pump it higher? Certainly it's not going to be the country of El Salvador. So look for another one. Maybe The Rock. Try The Rock. Maybe The Rock will pump BTC next. And in my opinion, whatever The Rock buys, the market will follow. So try to recruit that guy. I doubt that he needs more money, but maybe he'll buy into it and pump BTC higher. The Rock is the new Elon. Who is The Rock? Oh, you should know who The Rock is. You interrupt The Rock. The Rock will be the guy who'll get in that ring, tighten his shoes, and whoop your ass. What about Ape Land, AMC? The apes are also melting down under pressure. The short squeeze is not happening. The false hopes and dreams are starting to fade. And what do you know? AMC is getting whacked and half the hours is getting whacked more. Let's forget about after hours for now and look at the chart. Is there any hope for the apes to make a comeback? Yes, because we have not violated the last lower low and there is a potential to make a higher low and that will be a bottoming process at least in the short term. But if that lower low is violated, then the next destination will be filling the gap at around 32 bucks a share. And we'll take it from there. And that will be a lot of pain, by the way, for the apes who bought at 70, 65, even 50s, going back all the way down to 32. This is not what the retail side was hoping for. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar? tomorrow. The PPI, the producer price index, and this will be extremely important, in my opinion, more important than the CPI. And I already explained why. Then we have the beige book from the Fed. What are they going to say? Yeah, the economy is recovering. Oh, wait a minute. It's not recovering because if we say recovering, that means inflation rises higher. That means tapering. On the other hand, if we say that the economy is slowing down and not recovering as expected, then now we have the deflation fears, the market starts to panic, and therefore, the best guideline here for the BLS, for the Fed, for the Biden administration is releasing the numbers medium, just medium, to keep the market guessing and keep all possibilities open. Transitory, not transitory, to keep the debate open. The Cooks from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, struggled to cook the steak today to medium rare. 
And the reason is the ingredients they were handed beforehand, we're talking about used car prices, we're talking about airfare, hotels, consumer good prices, all came out too high. And it is very hard for the cooks to mask that flavor. The Fed will have a hard time releasing the beige book to please the market exactly. But we have some hope here for the market because uh, Papa Jerome is testifying in D.C. once again. So perhaps he can do a 180, throw cold water on inflation fears. We will see. But notice how every single week we either have Jerome testifying or we have these uh, Fed presidents on a propaganda tour, as if they were rock stars touring the country. From Barkin, to Clarida, to Williams, all of these personalities leading this satanic organization, going out on a propaganda tour to ensure that the stock market, the real estate market, will remain inflated and elevated. How long can they continue to play this game when the facts come out indicating the opposite? This is the million dollars question. When the Fed starts to crack, and we already have Kaplan, we already have Bullard, and now Harker, if more defectors join the so-called alarmists, what a joke. The media describes them as alarmists, really? Alarmists for speaking the facts and tr the truth? Stop it with the FUD. Bro. Okay, let's continue to dance until the music stops abruptly, and then we'll see how you like that. Anyhow, that's all I got for you for now, and I will talk to you again soon. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.